There's an African proverb that touches on an interesting idea about perspectives. It states, until the lions have their historians, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. It really speaks to the unique experiences each individual witnesses on planet Earth. Distilled, unless we look at different angles of history, the story is not fully told. Have you ever thought about the fact that we are each like a unique personal history book? We are witnessing the world like no one else ever will. We can jam what we deem important into 600 or so pages of a history book, but the perspectives on the world each of us holds could be just as educational. When I was a child, I would spend many summers sailing on my grandpa's boat. There was a crew, of course, people much older than I, who loved the sea and the sport of sailboat racing. Between salty turns around lettered markers during sailboat races, I got to know one man in particular. Cass always joked that we were being followed by pirates, and that sure sparked my young imagination. Or maybe it was his fiery blue eyes, rich accent, and sense of humor. Either way, in my mind, he was a fun, happy-go-lucky sailing buddy. You can imagine my surprise when I found out later, in my teenage years, that he had first-hand experiences in German-occupied and invaded territories growing up in the 1940s. All of a sudden, History was alive. Alive in the perspective and memories of Cass Terhorst. Going back to my idea that each perspective can serve as a historical record, I knew that it was important to capture the essence of this man's childhood to add one more voice, another fresh story, to the archive of this time period. His story is not one of a journey through concentration camps, not the conventional tale we hear told but his experiences changed him forever, dictated his future, and he is not without losses. His perspective gives one view of a Jewish boy unknowingly hiding, tells a tale of adults who risked everything to do what they felt was morally right, and paints a picture of Holland as it was during World War II. Want me to start? Yeah. Okay. My name is Cass Terhorst. <clears throat> K-A-S, and last name T as in Tom, E-R-H-O-R-S-T. <clears throat> as an abbreviation because my real name is Casper, K-A-S-P-E-R. Mm -hmm. But when the kids were 11, 12 years old, they couldn't possibly have a father with the name of Casper. You know, Casper the Friendly Ghost. So I shortened it, and everybody knows me by the name of Cass. My passport and so on still says Casper, but and nobody knows me by that name. Uh, <clears throat> I currently live in Santa Barbara, where I live now for uh, 17, going on to 18 years uh, after I retired. Before that, I was living in Los Angeles. Uh, before that, I lived in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and before that in Canada, where I immigrated to, uh, from Holland. I was born in Holland, in Amsterdam, that is, is the capital city. And <coughs> uh, I was there during World War II. Some of my recollections are somewhat limited and some are very, very clear. The time before I went into hiding, uh, I have no memory of. It is a blank. I went into hiding. I don't even know how that came about, but I wound up in a Catholic monastery 
even though I was a Jewish boy and not Catholic at all. Isn't that something that your mind can be closed off so? Yes. And as I said before, it really bothered me. And I went into some heavy psychiatry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the end, he said, we have to forget about it. Let the sleeping dogs lie. You're doing fine. And yeah. yeah. So that is. But I have gone to the school I used to go to, and I can see the building, but it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And I was introduced there, and I was told a number of times that I was an orphan, that there were no family. And therefore, uh, there was no, never any visitor. And that if you are an orphan and there is no family, then that is logical. Uh, it must have been drilled into me a number of times because I was absolutely, totally convinced that I was an orphan and that I didn't have any family. Uh, I was sheltered by the monks. It was an order of the brothers of uh, Our Lady of Seven Sorrows, translated from the Dutch. And uh, they took care of me from the age of 11 until I immigrated in the age of about 24. These people took enormous risks because during the Nazi occupation of Holland, uh, hiding Jews was uh, punishable by death instantly. Now, the setting at the monastery in Amsterdam, uh, the name of the place is called Aloysius. Uh, it's an, an, an saint's name. Uh, it is located in the old part of Amsterdam. It occupies a big a city block, completely closed, all four sides, four, three four-story buildings all around, a chapel included in it, and uh, uh, an inner courtyard uh, paved, and that was our place where we could play and entertain. Uh, I have very fond memories of these people. I, uh, in the time that I was there, uh, I got to know uh, about a hundred of the monks and, uh, and so some of them I only knew very superficially. Uh, there were about twelve that I knew longer, that stayed longer, and there were about four or five that I, uh, uh, I was very close with and that I knew almost the whole period. Uh, that period can be broken down into two parts. One is uh, uh, during the war and the period after the war. During the war the monastery was led by, uh, uh, by an, uh, what they call an overste and uh, he was a very stern person uh, just to give a feeling of how he was as an individual. Uh, there were long stone hallways in the monastery and if uh, you would, as an individual boy, would walk in there and he would enter, he would say, uh, hum, hum, and you would stop, stand to the side, bow your head and he would walk by and only when he was out of the hall then you could continue on your way. Uh, his name was Stephanus. Now, I paint this picture as a very stern, but that was part of that whole culture at the time. At the same time, he did an enormous job. As I mentioned earlier, there were about a hundred people in that monastery. Uh, uh, probably about 80 boys and about 20, 30 uh, monks. And he was able 
to keep that whole lot fed, closed and warm. Uh, he also was involved with the underground and hid other people and gave passage to other people. And a number of times that the Germans were after him and he was hiding behind the coals in one of the basements. The basements in that monastery was something else. They were endless tunnels that were hundreds of years old and everybody was scared to death of and I love to go spooking in there and looking. Uh, some of them were used for uh, storage and so on, but there were whole areas that uh, you would think you would fall off the end of the world if you go in there. I was always fixing things as a kid, 12, 13, 14 years. And I'd read somewhere to make a crystal radio out of all discarded parts of an old, because there was no electricity. And a crystal radio is if you have a crystal and a whisker and a, a, a capacitor that is variable. You've seen them in old radios where you have the things that go fold in one another. Yeah. And you put it all together with a pair of earphones and a wire you can pick up and without electricity you can find it by the sender. And you have to seek it. And so that way I could listen to the British, uh, the Dutch trans uh, news out of B from, from the BBC. I could do that. I have to do it under the blankets, of course. And that was absolutely, absolutely the was, was penalty of death. That is, oh. And they would go where they would scan and they could get a reflection of that and find you. So you have to be extremely careful. Oh yeah, it was not without danger. But as a kid you don't realize and it, it still was done. I think I always behaved quite well. I learned all the rules and regulations of the Catholic religion because I had to live the life. Uh, mass and I became an altar boy, but just not mass, but you have the matin and the louden and the vespers and the three o'clock angelus when the bell rings you have to go on your knees. I also was in the chorus and I had apparently a very good voice and, uh, uh, and so I know uh, virtually all the Gregorian chants that are used in, during the different uh, church services, and my signature song was uh, Ave Maria. And during the, the second, third and fourth year of the war, uh, there was always a curfew at night. People were not allowed to be on the streets, and so the streets would be absolutely empty, except that the German soldiers and the, the special police force of the German army, called the Grüne Polizei, in English it means the Green Police. They had a particular uniform with a big metal shield, very ornate. Uh, and for that matter the SS would walk over the streets, which, because there was a curfew, nobody was allowed to be on the streets after dusk. They all wore boots with hot nails under it. Hot nails are metal nails under the soles and the heels. And on empty streets that were clonk, 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 so everybody would hear them coming down the streets and everybody would be scared to death and hide and so on. And there were windows at the monastery so we could hear that too. Uh, they were at the hallways. Uh, you were not allowed to have any light. If you had any light, all had to be uh, closed off and so uh, the atmosphere was always you're terribly afraid of the of the Germans doing searches so there were a couple of raids in the monastery and a couple of the monks might have thought this out because I was told that if a particular signal would ring. 
I would have to go to the attic and there was a special room set aside with big signs on the outside in German that said listed all the communicable diseases that were in there typhoid uh, I, I don't even know the English names for some of them but they were all listed there and that was playing on a national phobia in Germany all the Germans and it is hard to uh, to, 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 to characterize a whole, whole, com whole set of people but there is an, an enormous aversion, a scare of uh, communicable disease among the German population, certainly in those days. And so I was told to go there and a couple of times I had to go there and there were some other people. But we never talked about that. So I don't know where the underground people that were hiding, where the people that the Germans tried to hide, where there were a couple of other Jewish people, I don't know. And uh, uh, there was never anything said about that. Uh, in the monastery I had to go to school of course and learn the catechism and uh, mass, English, no not English, uh, Dutch of course. English was not allowed to be taught. England was the enemy of, uh, of Germany and Germany was at war with England and with America. So right, um, and so schools. English was absolutely a no-no. Uh, because normally in, in Dutch schools, in grade schools, the kids learn, recite the Dutch language, French, German and English, but English was not allowed anymore. We all had jobs and I had a job uh, for a time uh, in the shoemakery where essentially uh, my job was to tear apart old, old shoes so that the little pieces that came off it could be used to repair other shoes. And uh, I also worked in the linen room and I learned how to use a sewing machine to put patches in bed sheets or uh, fix uh, pants. And even today I still have a little sewing machine and I can do small repairs. And I always uh, hear the monk behind me, careful. Do it right. I, he's always over my shoulder to tell me, don't do it sloppy, you do it right. I often had to peel potatoes, and some of them were half rotten potatoes, but still anything. And, and it is always a big mystery to me how he was able to provide enough food inside a city, Amsterdam, where especially during the last war, uh, year, as the winter of 1944-1945, was really starvation. It was the winter that was uh, historically cold. I don't think there was ever a period that the temperature dropped as far as during that winter. And there is lots of uh, stories about the Battle of the Bulls in the 44-45 how cold it was and everybody was unprepared. Well, that was the winter also in Amsterdam and Holland. People literally were dying on the streets. And, uh, uh, and uh, the Germans undoubtedly knew that summer of 44 that the end was near because they stripped the northern part of Holland completely empty hauled everything to Germany and then in the fall of uh, 44 the Allies, the Americans and the Canadians and the Brits uh, uh, had D-Day, went through France, Belgium and Holland but only the southern part, south of the, river, the three rivers that bisect the Netherlands, Holland. And so the northern part was completely cut off from any possibility of getting food from the southern part because that is where the farms are. Uh, it was so cold that uh, people that died couldn't be buried because people couldn't dig graves. And uh, I guess uh, the memories of history were well remembered that uh, there was a great fear of the Black Plague and so 
The churches in Amsterdam are confiscated, uh, cemented closed except for a small opening and all the dead bodies hauled in there and then it was full closed off cemented so that the rats and so on couldn't get at it. So that's kind of the picture of it was and here in the middle of that starvation there is this small group of people that are fed. Uh, I cannot recall that we ever were really hungry. Uh, before the last year, uh, so in 1943, 42, 43, and the summer of 44, I think, I'm not quite sure, uh, we boys with the monks would go all to the farm to the southern part of Holland that is below the river Rhine that later was uh, liberated uh, before the northern part was. Uh, and they had a farm there. There was a farmer, Farmer Jans Jansen, uh, and his wife and his boys. They, uh, the cattle were all out of the barn and then they put straw down and the boys would, uh, we as boys and the monks would sleep there. They made a little tent for the monks. So they were, but we had sleeping bags made out of, and I can still remember that uh, we didn't have sleeping bags, but we had blankets and big safety pins <laughs> to make sleeping bags out of it. Uh, we had many, many uh, good times of walks in the forest there and going to the different places around there, uh, campfires and plays that. Uh, that some of the monks organized, uh, very imaginative and very believable. Uh, yeah, the monks organized games where we were divided in groups and some were uh, uh, Nazis and some were underground and they had to smuggle uh, uh, down pilots or Jews from one place to the other and the interception and that was very believable in the forest and uh, uh, so I'm telling this to give an atmosphere how the relationship was with those monks and how much they were into what was good for the boys. Uh, at this point I like to give credit to those people. I'm very much aware that the last years we have become aware of terrible uh, sexual abuse in the Catholic Church by monks uh, with boys or kids in that matter. And there is no question about it, that is horrible. It is horrible for those kids that had to experience that, but I also like to mention that it is also horrible for all those monks that live the right life. They dedicate their life to a greater good and they were as much betrayed by those sick people that were amongst them as anybody else. And if there is anything I can do is to speak out and bear witness for all these heroic fantastic people that, uh, that literally dedicated their lives to a greater good, specifically bringing up boys that would otherwise be lost. Uh, after the, uh, Amsterdam was liberated, uh, uh, Stephanus, the head monk, was uh, replaced and another monk came in, uh, Gregory. What I haven't told you is that I had three sisters that I didn't know about. And they were also picked up uh, by the Salvation Army, which itself was illegal, because the Salvation Army is English. And a Major Bossart took care of those girls during the war, and they survived. And I didn't know I had sisters. And they one day said, gee, there must have been a boy, because they were, yeah. 
and they started searching through records and so on. And then, I don't know how they came to it, but uh, there is the Red Cross as a worldwide, uh, and I had not changed my name. So one day in Canada, I get a call that is somebody wants to contact you. Do you want to be contacted? I said, of course. And out of blue sky, I have three sisters. Yeah. That was as big a surprise as, yeah. What scares me most is that a country like Germany, who was the beacon of knowledge, of uh, culture, after all the Bachs, the Mozarts, the painters, the poets, the philosophers, Einstein, science, Einstein come from there, that a society with such a level of sophistication could be riled up to make it right, to try to conquer the world and, and, and eliminate a particular sort of people, the Jews and the Gypsies and the homosexuals. How is that possible? Because it were not just a couple of people that did it. It was a nation that was behind the Holocaust and the war and the war machine and the factories. It was a whole nation. Now, if that can happen to a society as sophisticated and advanced as Germany, and it was the most advanced society in the modern world, what stops us here in our society when you get those firebrands and the extremists. I'm scared to death that that could be repeated here. That is what scares me more than anything else. So what can you do against it? I cannot stand in the corner with a, with a rival, but wherever I can, I tell people Engage yourself, understand what is happening, don't let the radicals overtake us. Be reasonable and, 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 and beware of absolutes. Yeah? Thank you.